Good afternoon, good morning, uh, welcome to wherever you are. Uh, my name is Patrick Habecker, and I'm a research professor here at the Royal Drug Addiction Research Center at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, and I'm absolutely thrilled to be here today to talk with you all about policy and substance use across the United States, but also if we get into it, wherever our panelists want to discuss. Um, what we're going to do today is basically uh, introduce the panel itself. Um, we're interested in this simply because drug policy is effervescent. It changes a huge amount of how we think about drugs, how we think about substances, how we react to them, how we treat people who use drugs, the laws we shape, and our ability to react to changes in both the substance use supply, as well as a host of other factors. So we are joined today by four wonderful panelists to talk through this. The general format of the panel will be, we'll have the panelists introduce themselves for a few minutes and then go through some pre-curated questions that we've sort of been talking about with ourselves and hopefully are gonna be a fantastic discussion. And then we'll open up the floor to the audience. If there's questions that you wanna see answered or addressed, we'd love to have them. And we'll open that up a little bit later. So I'd like to start by asking each of the panelists to introduce themselves, talk a little bit about their backgrounds, perspectives on the topics, if you're interested, why you were interested in, uh, interested in willing to volunteer to take part of your day to join this panel. Uh, would love to hear it. And I'm just gonna start uh, on order from my screen. So Aaron, if you're willing, are you happy to sort of introduce yourself first? Sure, I'm Aaron Wynn Stanley. I'm an associate professor at West Virginia University. Um, and I'm also the vice chair of research for the Department of Psychiatry. So I've been doing research related to substance use disorders for about over 20 years. Um, by training, I'm a behavioral health services researcher. Uh, the majority of my work over the past several years is really focused on how to reduce the morbidity and mortality associated with the opiate epidemic and also um, investigating how we can use technology to improve uh, engagement and retention in behavioral health services. So um, more specifically, I've been really interested uh, most recently this past year in really investigating um, the problems that are being caused by fentanyl in initiating buprenorphine treatment in patients, uh, as well as uh, investigating um, how opiate overdoses may result in uh, cognitive disorders. Um, I'm also a co-investigator of the Appalachian Node of the NIDA Clinical Trials Network. So if there are a lot of interesting projects going on there, and as many of you know, West Virginia has had the highest rate of overdose deaths in the entire country for the past 20 years. So um, needless to say, I'm fairly passionate about uh, drug policy. I was really thrilled to um, be invited to uh, speak on this panel and actually be able to get, dedicate some of my time to drug policy work, which I feel like I increasingly don't have as much time to do lately. Um, so I was really excited, not to mention the fact that there are so many important pressing issues going on right now um, and so many exciting things to talk about. It was hard to actually pick the list uh, that Patrick provided us as some of the questions. So, and I'm really uh, honored to be on this panel with my uh, other colleagues from across the country. So thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Erin. Uh, Jennifer, you're next on my list. Yeah, it's okay for you. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Dr. Jennifer Mills Price, and I'm actually in the southern part of the state uh, with Dr. Wynn Stanley in West Virginia. Um, so we share a border with eastern Kentucky and um, or southeastern Ohio. Uh, so we're a pretty um, a small city of a, a little bit under 50,000 um, and surrounded by some pretty rural communities. And we share a lot of the issues um, that other small communities in the United States um, face. We have a struggling economy, high rates of obesity, chronic pain, other uh, chronic health issues. Um, also uh, a lot of illicit substance use, which results in high rates of neonatal abstinence syndrome and overdose deaths. Um, I'm a psychologist by training and clinical assistant professor at our medical school here in Huntington. Um, I've worked with our Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Medicine for the past uh, four years, and I'm really happy because this is my first um, kind of public presentation, having moved to our um, Division of Addiction Sciences in our uh, 
Department of Family and Community Health. So I'm really excited to be here with everyone. Um, I have worked with um, individuals with substance use disorders for quite a long time now, um, since about 2008 in different capacities, both as a clinician, as a treatment provider, and also as a forensic evaluator and an expert for the child welfare system in West Virginia. Um, part of what brought me to Marshall is um, Healthy Connections. So this was a community coalition that was established in Huntington in 2016, and a group of agencies in the area that work with families affected by substance use, particularly um, mothers with substance use and their children um, who've been prenatally exposed. Um, and what we've accomplished in the last four years is to establish a child care center with specialized training and caregiver training um, for children who were prenatally exposed to substances. Um, also to establish a pretty robust at this point family navigation program. I like to refer to these folks as uh, freelance case managers because they get to follow the family um, as opposed to belonging to a certain agency. So if patients uh, switch clinics, that's uh, no problem at all. Um, and also to help install peer recovery coaches in various areas such as emergency rooms, um, our neonatal um, treatment center, both our outpatient and our inpatient, um, and um, other uh, like outpatient substance use treatment locations. Um, what our future directions are, what we're working on right now is to streamline our research program uh, provide training and mentorship to other communities, particularly in Southern West Virginia. I'm sure Dr. Wynn Stanley understands there's a, a lack of uh, available treatment there. Uh, so we wanna help with some of those communities. Um, and also advocacy targeting judges, attorneys, and guardians ad litem um, working with families with uh, substance use disorder. Fantastic, and thank you. So Magdalena, you're next on my list, if that's all right. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining today. I'm Magdalena Serda. I'm a professor in the Department of Population Health at the NYU Grossman School of Medicine. I also direct the NYU Center for Opioid Epidemiology and Policy. I'm trained as, an, as a social epidemiologist and I do research on the social and policy drivers of substance use and violence. More recently, I've been doing work uh, looking at opioid policies, particularly those that uh, aim to regulate the prescription opioid supply, those that um, increase access to harm reduction efforts and those that affect access to treatment and how they impact opioid prescribing, chronic pain and overdose. We're also looking at the impact of marijuana legalization on different forms of substance use and related harms, uh, both in the United States and in other countries, in particular in Uruguay in South America. And we're interested in how opioid policies and marijuana legalization intersect to affect uh, pain, opioid prescribing, um, and opioid use. So that's uh, something that we're, we're increasingly looking at. Um, we, um, in addition to that, uh, we're also interested in looking at these emerging policies that are arising across the country. So we're going to start to evaluate the impact of Oregon 110 uh, decrim decriminalization uh, policy uh, in collaboration with Corey Davis at the Network for Public Health Law and the CDC. Uh, so I'm really excited to be here today and uh, to be talking about some of this work and uh, to be talking about uh, this with some of the leaders in the field. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you. Brandon, you are last on my screen. Yeah, thanks so much, Patrick. I'm um, thrilled to be here this afternoon. I'm zooming in from Providence, Rhode Island, where I am an associate professor in epidemiology at the Brown University School of Public Health. I'm a substance use epidemiologist. I focus a lot of my work on understanding the epidemiology of overdose. I've moved over the last several years to focus more on the evaluation of novel interventions to prevent overdose. A couple of studies right now involving primarily harm reduction tools like fentanyl test strip distribution. Um, and I also work with Magda as well on another um, study, intervention study that we're just rolling out here in Rhode Island to try to use machine learning methods to predict neighborhood level overdose burden and work with community partners in our state health department to try to identify those neighborhood hoods most at risk and, and provide resources in an efficient and effective way. 
Um, I'm also very interested in how we use data and scientific evidence to inform policy or not. Um, I'm the state director of our overdose data dashboard, preventoverdoseri.org. And I also am an expert advisor to the state's overdose task force here in Rhode Island. So I've seen firsthand, very fortunate to be able to witness some of that process through which data, scientific evidence inform at least state policy. I also have served as an ad hoc advisor to the Drug Safety and Risk Management Advisory Committee at the FDA and have learned a lot through that work in terms of federal policy in this space, particularly around new drug approvals um, and opioid related policy. Um, so I am thrilled to join my panelists and uh, jump into some of the questions you prepared for us, Patrick. All right, thank you again to everybody for the introductions and for being willing to join us today. So as a reminder for those attendees, we're gonna work through some questions that we've been sort of workshopping a little bit uh, first, but there is an opportunity for you to ask your own questions throughout. Uh, we're planning to get to them a little bit later on, but feel free to add them to a chat or Q&A as they come to you and we'll try and get to them. So the first question is that we talked about as a group. Um, so in the past two decades, we've developed a number of policies to address the overprescription of opioids here in the United States. Looking back now, reflecting on this, was this a successful policy approach or did we go too far? We're seeing increasing claims that patients can no longer receive adequate pain relief and as well as charges that reducing legal options. So by reducing the ability of people to prescribe and the access has pushed a large number of people into the illegal market for opioids. Our first, first. I can, I can take that, um, I take a crack at that. Um, I, I think the, you know, the evidence is, is mixed. I think we have some evidence from evaluations of opiate policies and adopted in different states that, for example, adoption of comprehensive prescription drug monitoring programs uh, that proactively provide authorized users of the PDMP with information about outlying dispensing and prescribing patterns so that they can actually use the PDMP data to respond adequately to to uh, potentially inappropriate prescribing, um, as well as laws that regulate pain management clinics uh, and the um, to prevent high volume dispensing that might be di diverted to the illegal market. We've seen that those kinds of laws um, are associated with a reduction in high dose and high volume opiate prescribing. And they're also associated with a decline in overdoses involving prescription opioids. So in that sense, we'd say, you know, those are a success, right? Um, at the same time, we have seen potentially some unintended consequences in the sense that we've seen that some of these laws are also associated with an increase in overdoses involving heroin and illegally manufactured synthetic opioids like fentanyl. And so in that sense, um, I think it's, it's, it highlights some areas for, for concern. Uh, but I, would, I wouldn't say that that, me, that, that's, that means that it is not a success. I think it means that to address a problem as complex as the opioid crisis, it's not one. It's not a one-component solution, right? We need a multi-pronged solution. So, at the same time as we're trying to pass these laws to regulate inappropriate opiate prescribing, we also need to invest in efforts to uh, increase access to evidence-based treatment for opioid use disorder, increase access to harm reduction efforts, and increase both research and access to evidence-based treatment for chronic pain, because we know that at the same time as we're addressing this overdose crisis, people live with chronic pain every day and they lack the tools to, to manage that pain adequately. Yeah, I'll jump in here. I think those are fantastic points, Magda. I, I think one way I think about this, Patrick, is that per, perhaps there was not a sufficient focus on understanding incidents versus prevalence. Uh, perhaps if there had been some more epidemiologists at the table, this, you know, we could have started from this framework where we obviously want to prevent um, inappropriate exposure or incident cases through reductions in, in, in overprescribing of opioids for minor procedures or uh, acute pain conditions. So that, as, as Magda said, is happening and is, is working to some degree. The issue is that those perhaps were misapplied, those same policies were misapplied to people 
who are currently experiencing opioid use disorder or in chronic pain, we saw adverse, adverse consequences of many of these policies in that population of people. And I think we still don't have a very firm scientific foundation to understand how to appropriately engage in patient-centered tapering um, and, and you know, other novel pain relief modalities as well. So I think that's where we as a nation and even as researchers missed the boat to some degree was understanding that we have a large number of people, over 2 million people who currently have opioid use disorder. And, and we don't want circumstances where policies really designed to prevent initiation or incident cases are having adverse consequences on that prevalent um, group, which unfortunately I think is what happened over the last decade. And I completely agree with uh, Brandon and Magda. I'd also add, I think some of the evaluations of um, these, the effectiveness of these policies have been difficult, right? Because they've been differentially implemented across states and are used, right? And states have different levels of resources in which to fund these efforts. So I, I witnessed that. Uh, dramatically when I moved from uh, Ohio to West Virginia, right, there's significantly fewer um, resources in West Virginia to, you know, monitor the PDMP and use it as a tool, uh, as opposed to Ohio. At the time I left Ohio, they were spending a million dollars a year, the state was, on uh, overdose uh, and prescription drug monitoring efforts. So, and that's, that budget is simply not available in West Virginia. So, um, but we definitely have a good idea that it is working as Max has already mentioned and that some of those key elements that have made um, some of those policy and regulatory changes effective. I think that's what, what's become, you know, a less clear to me and perhaps other panelists have a, a different perspective, but it's almost more the unintended consequences of this increased monitoring and the punitive sanctions associated with potentially over prescribing um, that have created sort of this fear among not just uh, prescribers, so you know, doctors and nurses, but uh, even in the news yesterday was a report from NPR and, and Dr. Price in West Virginia may have seen this right about um, the DEA cracking down on um, pharmacies for dispensing buprenorphine. So, you know, I think in, when we split this question up, Patrick, is, you know, overall we, we framed, the, you framed the question as in, you know, these opioid policies um, and our opioid medications. So on the one hand with prescription pain relievers, um, there's definitely evidence, but what has been the unintended negative consequence to other prescription opiates like buprenorphine um, used to treat, you know, uh, with it, uh, Oh, uh, opiate use disorder, and that unintended consequence is pretty substantial. It was quite a dramatic report for those who didn't see it uh, in, the, um, in the NPR just the other day. So, where a pharmacy really does, they're starting to turn away patients and not dispense for fear of these uh, DEA um, um, and not their regulatory crackdowns, I guess. So I think it's hard to monitor. And, you know, in a state like West Virginia, what's really challenging, right, is as we've been able to use SOAR money and other federal funds to increase access to buprenorphine treatment, that means we need more pharmacies, right, to help <laughs> dispense those prescriptions. And so, of course, there should be upticks in uh, the amount of uh, buprenorphine products they're dispensing, um, but how to sort of not get them tangled up in these um, in the sort of automated systems that, you know, that are looking for, you know, increases that might be problematic, so. I kind of like to add um, kind of a provider perspective to touch a little bit on like phenomenologically what some of these patients experience. I noticed in the, in the comments, someone's mentioning that as well. Um, so I worked for a comprehensive pain management clinic that included uh, mental health treatment, behavioral health treatment, uh, prim primarily provided through group therapy. Um, behavioral chronic pain management, as well as supportive counseling. Um, and, and also we have a psychiatrist that is on site about four hours a week to um, deal with comorbid depression and anxiety, which you know is uh, very high among individuals with chronic pain conditions. Um, a lot of the folks that made it to our clinic did so because we were the, the only game left in town. Um, we did have a lot of providers that were writing a high volume of prescriptions for opioids who, um, you know, as uh, regulations were being enforced, kind of um, 
took their shingle and left town. <laughs> and so we had a lot of people who are uh, very elderly, um, have multiple comorbidities, both psychological and physical, who all of a sudden are, were in acute uh, opioid withdrawal. Um, and also had an untreated chronic pain condition um, and for many behavioral health condition because um, also those prescribers were giving uh, benzodiazepines to a lot of patients, whether they were you know, indicated or not as for another day. But um, what we've really had to work through with a lot of patients is this feeling that they are now being viewed as a drug addict um, through no fault of their own. And, and again, you know, this, there's some cultural factors that play into that. We're a rural area. Um, a lot of our patients are particularly rural. They may drive two hours each way to our clinic um, from an area in which, you know, there is no psychologist in their county, for example. Um, and so we're, we're placing an, an uneven burden on the patient as opposed to being able to provide those resources that you know Dr. Winstanley was talking about. Um, you know, we're already upside down in West Virginia in terms of behavioral health. We don't have enough psychiatrists, we don't have enough psychologists. That gap will likely not close in the next 30 years. Um, and then we are adding this patient population to treat um, and the resources were not uh, not provided. Um, when those decisions were made. So I, I do think a lot of patients felt abandoned um, and processing why these changes were made and how could this come to happen that you develop a physical dependence on a medication without any ill intent, uh, processing that has been part of the treatment that uh, patients have felt uh, a lot of relief for their self-judgment and, and depressive symptoms. waiting to see if there's other comments on that. Um, and thank you for catching uh, the comment in the chat. Um, I think we're gonna, unless someone wants to immediately address this, I think we're gonna come back to this at the end because there's some really interesting implications there about who gets to make these decisions and how, how do we invite people to the table? Um, so we might move slightly unless there's other comments directly on it. Okay, yeah, go ahead. I, I I can just say from my experience, they hate it. <laughs> Siphoning chronic pain patients into the OUD care system, you know, that is something we had more access to in, in our area. We have um, MAT clinics that they would be eligible uh, to enter, but because of just that, the psychological consequence of thinking of oneself as a, a pain patient one day and then suddenly a, a drug addict the next, I think that's difficult for a lot of people, particularly elderly people who've lived a very pro-social lifestyle. All right. Um, so sort of the second question that we have on the list in sort of this section of the panel, increasingly we're seeing this term called the poison drug supply. I feel like a few years ago, this was something that I saw in activist circles or on uh, drug research Twitter, but now is increasingly in the media, it's in the news, it's um, being used more. Um, and it's being linked to ever increasing deaths from overdoses in the US. Uh, could the panel talk a little bit about what this is referring to? Uh, to what extent has policy led to this current situation? And what are some of our options to reduce overdose deaths in light of what we're calling a poison drug supply? Sure, I can take this one, Patrick, first, if you like. Um, the way that I think about this is that it's a highly uncertain drug supply. People do not know what they are using. The potency varies tremendously. Um, the type of cuts, the adulterants are varying, and this continues to be a problem, not just in opioids, but in uh, stimulants as well. And so one immediate way to, one more acute immediate way to address the problem is to provide information to people on, on what are in these substances and so that they can make more informed decisions about their risk reduction practices. So I think that's where we've seen a lot of interest in drug checking technologies, which aim to do exactly that, right? Which establish either the presence or the concentration of some substance like fentanyl uh, to give people that information and encourage engagement and risk reduction uh, practices. So that's one thing I think also, we'll maybe get into this a little bit later, but thinking about the environment in which highly, you know, drugs that have highly uncertain composition are used as critical as, as well. So changing the actual environment in which these drugs are used is another way to reduce overdose risk through the provision of naloxone or supervised consumption spaces, which we'll 
I think, talk about later. Stepping back for a moment in terms of how we got here, you know, we have taken the approach in this country of deeming some drugs illegal and then highly criminalizing people who use them um, for the greater part of an entire century. And what we have seen is that that has not worked. Um, and that's not a subjective statement from me. The data shows that we've had an exponential increase in drug overdose deaths for more than three decades. And so at this point, I would argue strongly that we will not see a fundamental shift in that trajectory until we rethink how we choose to regulate uh, these substances. The exact way in which we do that, I do not have the answer to those questions. I think this is one thing where we all need to work together and try to come up with a more person-centered and compassionate and public health focused approach to regulate substances because what we have been doing clearly um, is, is not working. Uh, so that's uh, an, a call to action for everyone on the panel, particularly the students to start thinking more broadly and maybe looking to other countries for broader solutions to address this, this very co uh, complicated and complex issue. I would say I think the poison drug supply, right, more often than not, is really referring to illicitly manufactured fentanyl. So, and it's really important to think about some other um, tandem legislation that's going on right now. So it's really hard, you know, given that fentanyl, fentanyl analogs and the precursor chemicals can be easily shipped across the country through the mail, it makes interdiction efforts very difficult. So there's a lot of, I think, disagreement on how to stop the flow of fentanyl, these illicitly manufactured fentanyl analogs and precursors into the country. And so the, um, we had a temporary ban on a class-wide um, ban on fentanyl compounds um, that was really, you know, identified by some folks in the DEA as a fantastic policy, right? So that you don't just ban fentanyl, but that you, if you ban the whole class, then we can um, prevent those analogs from coming into the country from um, places like China and, and other places as well through the mail. Uh, unfortunately, when we do these class-wide bans, uh, it also means that we haven't done the research necessary to investigate uh, these compounds. We don't really know much about them. Most of what we know about fentanyl is based on um, uh, pharmacodynamic and, and pharmacokinetic studies on, on pharmaceutical grade fentanyl. So we really have had limited opportunities to truly understand the abuse potential and also any therapeutic benefits of these compounds. And just because they're in the same class doesn't mean that they have the same drug effects. So it's simultaneously, we implement these policies like a class-wide ban to prevent interdiction, uh, but simultaneously it could be tying our hands behind our back to be able to identify um, how to new products to reverse overdoses from these highly potent uh, fentanyl compounds like car fentanyl. Um, and it becomes really complicated and how we move that forward. Yeah, I would say that, you know, the, the increased prevalence of um, illegally manufactured synthetics is driving the overdose crisis is, has led positively to, to an increased focus in harm reduction efforts. And so states, you know, almost all states have passed laws to facilitate access to naloxone. Uh, many states have passed laws to, uh, Good Samaritan laws to uh, protect bystanders who call for help. Um, to, and there's increasing, even in the federal um, overdose prevention plan, mention of fentanyl testing strips. And so all of, all of those things, I think, are, are quite positive in terms of preventing deaths from, uh, from overdoses in, involving fentanyl. But I, do, I would agree with, with Brandon that, in a way, while this is a very positive move, it is a little bit um, too little. <laughs> and that uh, we are not, we are, we're, we're going to have to keep with these kinds of short term responses until we do something more broad and cross cutting, like thinking about decriminalization of all drugs. Um, because only by thinking about decriminalization of all drugs will we be able to, first of all, regulate the safety of these products. Um, and be able to ensure that people 
who, uh, who use drugs have access to the services that they need, uh, both in terms of how they use and in terms of treatment, if they're interested in treatment. And those are really are going to be the essential services that we need in order to prevent people from overdosing and prevent people from dying from uh, overdoses. So, you know, we're, and I think we're going to talk about Oregon in, in, a, in a few minutes, but hopefully we're going to be moving towards a more broad-based um, approach to thinking about drugs. Fantastic. Um, so I think the next question that sort of builds a little bit in line for this is that, you know, Rhode Island is set to become the first state to officially sanction safe consumption spaces in 2020. I believe in March is the date for when the first one can open. Um, and this links directly to a lot of what we were just talking about with this idea of a poison drug supply or an uncertain drug supply. So can we talk a little bit about what is a safe consumption uh, space trying to accomplish? What is this policy trying to do? The gaps it's filling in, at least in the U.S., but also what does it fail to address? You know, we just talked a little bit about, you know, these are small steps. Is this a complete step? Is this a final step? Or is this just one more piece of a policy puzzle here? Yeah, I can take that one, um, Patrick, and then I'd love to hear from the other panelists and their thoughts. So um, supervised consumption spaces or safe consumption spaces, we're calling them harm reduction centers here in Rhode Island, typically have a number of public health goals. One is immediate, which gets back to my earlier point around changing the environment in which drugs are used to be safer. So we know, in fact, that overdose fatality is 100% preventable. If someone is present, if oxygen and naloxone are present, uh, overdoses can be reversed. So de death does not need to happen. So the one key purpose of these spaces is to provide that safe environment um, to avoid overdose uh, death. The second goal is typically a little bit broader, and that relates to the fact that many people who use drugs have been highly criminalized. Um, many, let's be honest, have had horrible experiences in our healthcare and addiction treatment system. They've been discriminated against. Uh, and so many are very reticent to uh, access existing services. Um, one key feature of these spaces is the aim to be low threshold, low barrier, truly meet people where they are at, uh, allow that consumption to occur, but through that process, build rapport with folks, connect people to peer counselors or uh, nurses or addictions counselors, start to repair those relationships, those clinical relationships and those service relationships and over time connect people uh, to things like treatment, recovery resources, housing supports, and so on. So that's a little bit of a, of a longer term goal, a slower process, but what we have seen from evaluations in Canada around the world is that it works very effectively and that people who use these services are more likely to engage in treatment and recovery services as a function of this relationship building process that happens. I wanna emphasize that's truly critical in a lot of these spaces. They rely on relationships. Um, I think one, one thing to keep in mind with supervised consumption spaces is that they're not a panacea necessarily. And at the end of the day, um, they are you know, gonna be most effective in places with high, high levels of overdose and where there are many people particularly who can access them. We know that most people who do live or reside within a mile of where they're physically located. So I'm actually not sure how appropriate these kind of interventions may be in, in more rural areas or even suburban areas. I think that's where we need some more innovation around how to provide these kind of services in those settings, whether that's through technologies, there's a, a, another you know, set of programs called Never Use Alone where people can be connected over phone and be almost like virtually supervised. So there could be other innovations in this space to provide services uh, outside of a brick and mortar facility, which typically are in um, larger urban centers with a high concentration of people who would benefit from these kinds of services. I, I think that's that's really interesting, Brandon. Actually, the, the thought about 
how do we um, increase access, essentially, how do we increase access to harm reduction yeah. services, right? And so thinking of uh, safe consumption sites as one type of intervention within a broader package of interventions to increase access to naloxone um, for people who use drugs, as well as people who know people who use drugs, uh, to increase access to ways to test uh, the drug supply, um, to increase access to, to clean needles. Um, and then in terms of safe consumption, again, thinking about different ways to do that in, in different kinds of areas. Uh, so I, I really like the idea of thinking um, what are the types of systems that we need um, in, in different kinds of, of settings within this country. And I haven't seen, I think, a lot of discussion about that. So that seems like a, a really interesting area for for future investigation. So let's shift gears very slightly here. Uh, we've been focused mostly on opiates uh, to some extent in our discussion so far. But you know, there's one of the biggest changes in the past 20, 30 years has been the regulation of cannabis and marijuana. Uh, you know, there's now 18 states that have recreational use laws passed and 36 that have medical. And each of these states has sort of implemented their recreation medical market a little differently. They're changing or handling supply chains in different ways. So what do you think we have learned so far from this new regulated market? Uh, what should states and the federal government be thinking about for establishing new markets? And have we seen evidence of how this shift from a completely underground market to regulated either for medical or recreational use, how has this affected other parts of society in these states or in some of the other countries that we know across uh, the globe that have made these moves? I can, I can take that. Um, yeah, and again, I would love to know what others think about this. Um, I think, you know, it speaks to, to, to this broader issue that we were talking about before about um, within the area of decriminalization and regulation of the supply. So in particular with cannabis, um, you know, the, the, I think one of the main drivers for legalization um, was to uh, protect uh, people from involvement in the criminal justice system for uh, misdemeanors related to, to possession and use of uh, of, of cannabis and particular to reduce racial and ethnic inequalities and involvement in the criminal justice system. And I think, you know, that's, that's a, a very important aim um, of these types of policies. Um, you know, so far, uh, there've been many studies that have tried to evaluate the impact that uh, legalization of medical and recreational use of cannabis has had on, on health, particularly on, on drug use. Uh, so far, we've found that particularly um, legalizing recreational access to marijuana is associated with an increase in use of marijuana uh, among adults and an increase in cannabis in cannabis use disorder among uh, existing cannabis users. Um, and potentially, there's some evidence that suggests there might have also been an increase in co-use with other drugs, including alcohol. So in that sense, you know, we, we balance all of of these different goals that we have, um, the potential increase in use uh, may be an unintended uh, consequence of some of these types of laws. Um, however, I don't think this means that we shouldn't legalize. I think it just means uh, that we should think about how we legalize uh, marijuana. Uh, so if you think about tobacco and alcohol, right, uh, there are also products that we know are harmful to our health and yet they're legal. And we've learned a lot about how to protect people's health by regulating tobacco and alcohol. Uh, so what I would like to see with marijuana, and I don't think we're seeing yet, is, is learning from, for, from particularly tobacco about how to regulate marijuana safely to address those unintended consequences. So I think you know states should really think about uh, packaging of the product, what types of labeling in the packages, safety and potency uh, of the products, um, location of uh, retail outlets, investment in prevention programs, particularly to reduce early initiation of cannabis use among adolescents, since we know about the long-term risks of that. Um, I also think we can learn lessons from what's going on in other countries. So for example, 
in the United States, while states differ in the ways that they've legalized cannabis, um, they've all adopted a highly commercial approach to legalization. That is where there, there is relatively less control over, over the product, right? Um, uh, but there are other places like, for example, in Uruguay, in South America, that was the first country to legalize as a country uh, recreational uh, use of marijuana. And they've adopted a very different approach uh, where the government um, regulates the type of product that is produced, uh, the potency of the product, who sells it, and how you have access to it and how much you have access to and so, you know, that's another extreme of, of the approaches to legalization. And so I think uh, by comparing what's going on in, in places like in Uruguay and what's going on in the United States, perhaps we can identify those types of approaches to legalization that are most protective of public health while still protecting people's uh, rights and reducing uh, racial inequalities in criminal justice involvement. Yeah, just to pick up on one of um, such a good point you made, Magda, I would I would proffer that addressing racial ethnic inequities should actually be one of the primary goals of a lot of this, a lot of these uh, new laws and uh, decriminalization um, regulations. You know what I fear is that what we have been embarking on is a system where racial ethnic inequities might actually be exacerbated because you know if you're not addressing the historical harms um, upon which racialized communities have faced by far the burden and at the same time are creating a commercialized market where only a certain segment of the population is benefiting, i.e. those people with access to capital and engagement in that market, you could very quickly actually exacerbate existing racial ethnic inequities, right? So. What I would really love to see in a lot of these measures is more of a focus on addressing some of the historical harms, whether that be through a reparations framework or at least a focus on expungement of, uh, of, of, of past convictions. Um, because what I, what I don't think we wanna see is people continuing to suffer the consequences of criminalized cannabis or other drugs, be that, uh, challenges accessing you know employment student loans housing while other people make vast profits <laughs> off a newly legalized product so um you know i would learn i'm, I'm looking forward to learning more out in our discussion around oregon around how that state might might be um, addressing some of these issues but I, I i do think as a society we need to put more policymakers need to put more focus on this I just wanted to also elevate a point that Magda made because it's just so important, right? Implicit in her comments is who financially benefits, yeah. right? We've already been down this road with prescription opioids and the pharmaceutical company with these ongoing lawsuits. So really this, you know, she's presented this opportunity to say, how are we doing this here compared to other countries? Um, and really asking a question of who financially benefits because part of the issue will be even when, as we develop these policies to better regulate, which I couldn't, I mean, her, her comments were just so dead on. I agree with them and so eloquently stated about we need that regulation piece on uh, recreational uh, cannabis products. Um, but when you say who benefits <laughs> uh, from that and the financial, uh, you know, financially from that, it may influence, unfortunately, that regulatory process. Um, so I think really it would really behoove us to, um, as she recommended, you know, look at other countries and other models um, um, when, as we move forward and more states probably continue to move towards uh, recreational cannabis. We, we may discuss this a bit in a bit more detail later on, but I, I'd like to add from my point of view, a concern I have um, in West Virginia's implementation of uh, medical marijuana is the disconnect um, between the kind of the legislative language um, and what might be enacted in policy, particularly with uh, the child welfare system. Um, and I do think that, you know, even though West Virginia is a predominantly Caucasian state, um, I, in my experience, I've seen uh, differential prosecution of child welfare cases with African American families. Um, even legal opioids, um, we still have an issue with those uh, being um, perceived in a, a very negative light by certain judges or 
the CPS workers in certain counties, and although this, the state laws are in keeping with public health, um, how they're actually implemented is, is not often. Um, and so I, I do see, you know, being aware of potential uh, unintended consequences of something that by and large could be very good, um, but there may be some areas in which, um, you know, these kind of the two two sides need to communicate with one another a bit more. Um, I, I noticed uh, with New York, when they recently passed a decriminalization um, legislation, they also included in that some child welfare language, but not all states have done that. Um, and I know in Colorado and I believe Washington State both, um, someone can still have a child welfare case, um, even consuming marijuana completely legally. So that's something that um, as, as a state that's kind of at the beginning of that process, I have a concern about. Sorry, I was on the wrong tab when I tried to unmute myself. There was a lot going on there. And there was, was a couple of different points to take from this. Um, and I think let's shift slightly to Oregon. It's come up a few times. We're talking about large scale regulatory schemes. What have we learned from prior uh, regulatory uh, changes such as tobacco, uh, alcohol is a fascinating shift. But you know, just last year we witnessed this really large change where the state of Oregon passed measure 110 to effectively, effectively decriminalize personal, personal possession of all drugs that we typically consider illegal. Uh, and now people found in possession of those substances either now pay a fine or go to a drug treatment uh, center instead of jail or prison. It's a complete diversion from that criminal justice outcome point. And this is a really marked departure for drug policy in the US. Uh, this is a really large scale. It's not substance specific. Um, so is this, uh, sort, of, sort of things that we're thinking about and coming out of these conversations? What can we learn from Measure 110? Do we think we'll see similar measures in other states? Um, and what do you think this type of effort brings to substance use policy, uh, as well as things to maybe watch out for as 110 enters its, I guess, uh, full implementation? Yeah, I think it's a. It'll be really fascinating to to follow this, right, and to, and to see what happens um, in Oregon uh, following the the passage and enactment of, of one ten. Um, I think it's really, as others have said, it's really a historic moment um, in drug policy. Um, what what I really find interesting is the shift uh, from focusing on uh, criminalization of drug use to essentially focusing on public health and uh, the need for investment in treatment um, and harm reduction efforts. Uh, because essentially that they are proposing to use funds from taxes and uh, for money that would have been funneled uh, to the criminal justice system and diverting those funds into treatment, um, including investment in services such as triage, case management, linkage to care, uh, mobile outreach, peer recovery, as well as um, overdose education, naloxone access, um, and access to syringes. Uh, so I think particularly this investment in increased access to treatment, as well as the shift uh, of thinking about of treating uh, drug possession from a misdemeanor uh, to a lower uh, type of violation, um, that you can actually um, either pay a fine for or have that fine waived if you agree to take a, a health assessment is, is, is pretty um, historic. And so I think we're going to have to see uh, what happens in terms of uh, the health of people who use drugs um, following the enactment of this measure, what happens to overdoses, um, what happens to access to evidence-based treatment for opioid use disorder, um, and other types of substance use disorders. Um, what happens to arrests, right? Um, I think those will be all important outcomes. And we will have to really carefully think about, again, this same theme that we've been talking about, about who benefits uh, from this law, right? Um, are there uh, racial ethnic inequalities in the impact that this law has? Are there income inequalities in the impact of this law? Particularly with this $100 fine uh, that you had to, that um, you would have to, to pay for, for drug possession. Um, 
but I think overall it's 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 a really great opportunity to learn and to think about approaches that um, shift from criminalizing people who use drugs to thinking about the types of services that they need to live a harmonious, safe, and dignified life. Yeah, fabulous points, Magda. I don't have much to add to that. You summed it up so well beyond the fact, I think that we should listen and learn uh, about this organ experience, you know, listen to the people who are able to successfully push for this measure and learn from the evaluations that I'm sure are forthcoming. I, I would, to get to one of the parts of your question, Patrick, I would hope and anticipate that we would see similar efforts in other states. I think um, one thing this does, I've learned about recently is this idea of this Overton window, which is the window that defines the range of policies that are acceptable in, in sort of mainstream discourse. And one thing that something like Measure 110 does is, is it expands that window, right? So hopefully um, by Oregon passing this measure that makes this perhaps like palatable at least as an option to be discussed in other states or ideally at a federal uh, level. So I think we shouldn't under um, estimate it's the impact of, of just even one state passing this kind of historical measure because of the spillover it has on, on the other uh, conversations and debates across the country. I agree, Brandon. It's, it's such an exciting time, right? I would have never said just five or six years ago. I mean, I think it was, it was, it was probably more than a decade ago that you weren't really allowed to put harm reduction in any of your federal grants, right? Um, and so we're really starting to see this change and, and not just some, a few states, but you know, being able to talk more openly about harm reduction, syringe exchange programs. Um, and you know, the truth is, is that we, we are not doing a fantastic job, right? Uh, the war on drugs is, is absolutely a failure. Um, overdose deaths continue to increase. Um, and so we really need to explore new innovative models um, and reprioritize um, treating people that use drugs compassionately um, and help keeping them safe. Um, so I think it's really exciting to be able to see what's going on in Oregon and what's gonna be happening in Rhode Island um, and hopefully really learn from those uh, sooner rather than later. Um, in particular about what's working in those states uh, and how we might tailor that uh, or uh, modify those programs as they expand. Absolutely, all good points. And it continues to be interesting to see these, these steps, right? You know, the Overton window is a great point. You used to be able to talk about decriminalization. You had to talk about Portugal or Spain or another country or Vancouver, right? And someone will always say, hey, that will never work in the US. But now we get to see. Same thing with Rhode Island uh, with the harm reduction centers, right? So very exciting times. Um, so in line, which is sort of that last bit, um, Aaron had that nice comment about, you know, it used to be you can even put harm reduction in your grant application. But just recently, the US Department of Health and Human Services released a new overdose prevention strategy focused on four areas where they list explicitly primary prevention, harm reduction, evidence-based treatment and recovery support. So is this evidence at the federal level that this is a new effort that signaling, you know, in, in the right direction or the new elements, is this gonna be a, a real change you think from the federal end or federal policy that may trickle down into states? And, you know, what's still missing from this? Is this still just a, yet another small step or is this the potential for something new? I, I think um, there were a lot of great things in the in the Department of Health, uh, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services overdose prevention strategy, um, namely the mention and and the support for harm reduction efforts, um, as well as um, the prioritization of increased access to evidence based treatment um, and removal of. Um, administrative training and financial barriers to, to treatment. Um, 
I, I think those those were real a real important shift uh, from what we've seen in the past. Um, I think one area that I wish um, had been addressed is is thinking. Um, so we we focus a lot on on treatment. We focus a lot on on harm reduction, which is great. Um, I would also like to see a more of a focus on primary prevention and essentially thinking about fundamental causes of uh, of drug misuse and of experiencing harms from from drug use. And so thinking about social policies, economic policies that should be prioritized um, to address this overdose crisis. We've seen with COVID, right, that we've seen more people die from overdoses than ever before. Now, part of that is likely because, you know, of the fentanyl drug supply, because of um, decreased access to, to treatment, because of just decreased access to harm reduction. But part of it is likely because of, you know, the economic crisis that, um, that that has shaped the pandemic. And so thinking about other types of policies like so, uh, housing policies and um, eviction moratoria, income supplements uh, for families, um, you know, all of, all of those kinds of social welfare, welfare policies that reduce social and racial inequities are likely also part of what we need to do to address this crisis. And I would hope that in the future, federal strategies also think about that. Yeah, I completely agree, Magda. I thought, you know, it was interesting to compare this with uh, the Biden administration's approach to climate change, which seemed a bit more of a whole of government approach. My understanding is that each department is tasked with identifying how their work may be impacted by climate change and how they could address climate change. I, I wish I had seen the same thing here. It's like more engagement with other uh, you know, departments, agencies within the federal government to address some of those fundamental causes, as you called them, Magda, would have been nice to see. So whether that's unemployment or housing issues, expanding beyond just the immediate sort of HHS and make this a whole of government approach, um, I think ultimately would, would put the response in a stronger and ultimately hopefully more effective uh, position. But none, nonetheless, with the, Patrick, this was a uh, a wonderful change from the previous administration, which had focused so much on um, interdiction and enforcement. Um, the, the other comment I would say is that the document itself has the, these four pillars and then guiding principles. If you look into the detailed strategy, there are principles around things like data and evidence and also equity. And I really like to, I like to see the focus on health equity and racial health equities racial health equity as a guiding principle specifically. I think what I would like to see next is a clear articulation of, okay, that is a principle. Now, what are the specific programs that the federal government can put in place or support states enacting to actually address and mitigate these vast um, you know, racial health inequities when it comes to addressing drug-related problems? So I think it's a good step to see it as a principle what I'd hope to see next is some enactment of that, that principle and actually support for programs whose goal is to address those issues clearly. I would, I would say that, you know, acknowledging the, um, you know, the emphasis on harm reductions and some new things was great, but I would say overall I was underwhelmed, um, mm -hmm. you know, because I think, you know, the truth is that at least in, in the, documents that I reviewed that, you know, that some of the efforts are, you know, it's nice to see them consolidated there, but they're not actually new. Yeah. <laughs> some of them are honestly long overdue. Like they talk about the fact that, you know, the, uh, F the FDA finally in July, 2020, um, recommended co-prescribing of naloxone to patients prescribed prescription opiates and, and um, uh, medications for opiate use disorder. So, I mean, that's great, but that's, it's so long overdue. Um, and to sort of put it on your new website was a little bit of a, um, you know, it's nice to see it consolidated, but I think I'm a, I, perhaps a little bit more jaded. <laughs> and I think one of the things that's problematic that I, I like the point that you made, Brandon, about comparing it to the climate policy, um, because I think in what, you know, Jennifer's point around what happens, and I know where, this is one of our questions about the impact of the, um, drug policies on children and families. And what we really see is a lack of coordination 
right? So, and that's what you sort of see on this page is you see these independent people working, but to what extent were these truly collaborations where the, we're aligning on what our goals of these policies are um, and, and mapping that out. So this could be a step in that direction, um, but really trying to see some cross-cutting policy and agency um, work, which I think is going to be important um, uh, to that. So that's really great. And, and let's keep at this idea of sort of fundamental causes. Um, so a lot of the stuff we've talked about today is, is very end focused, right? How do we prevent people from dying from an overdose? How do we um, manage sort of the outcomes of some of these markets? But, you know, as has been brought up, you know, to what extent are we looking at this primary prevention piece? But if we had our ability to like influence at a large scale, what are some of these fundamental causes we might go after and what might these look like? And while I give you a second to think about this, because we're now off script, um, I just want to remind those who are in attendance that, you know, we're sort of into the section where uh, please invite your questions in, put them into the chat. We'll start filtering those in. Um, and hopefully that brief 20 seconds was enough time for our panelists to come with up with how they want to change the world in terms of sort of fundamental causes and primary prevention. And I'll just open that to anybody. If given your druthers and your funding, what do you think we should go after? Well, why don't I just, I'd like to start with a fundamental problem of addressing these down, these, you know, the upstream issues is what, that we can't make these changes in the four year political term, right? Um, so, you know, really trying to better understand how we motivate policy and politics, um, because these are, you know, longer term questions, right? That they're, they're, we're not going to be able to see, you're not going to in, in, invest, you know, in year one of your political term money in prevention and see that return on investment before you're up for re-election. Um, and that really is sort of, you know, one of those key problems, uh, I think, that we're going to have um, in, in addressing prevention. But it is, it's, you know, I mean, I think it's best to say, frankly, prevention is, is not as sexy um, you know, when you're trying to, you know, make drug policy changes. And so, you know, getting people to talk about these harder characteristics, how do we address poverty and despair and unemployment and fair housing um, and understand that an early investment um, is really critical. And that's, you know, um, a harder sell. Yeah, and in, in some of our work, we found, for example, that um, expanded access to healthcare, so for example, with Medicaid expansion, um, that was associated, so states that expanded Medicaid coverage um, experienced a greater decline in overdoses. So, you know, access to healthcare, a very basic right, right? It's not just focused on overdose uh, for everyone. Uh, I think that is a, is, it could be a huge priority in terms of um, of, re of addressing this problem. Um, I think, um, you know, we have an opportunity with some of the changes that were enacted during COVID um, to evaluate the impact of potential social policies. So for example, the enactment of unemployment benefits, um, the adoption of housing eviction moratoria, um, the um, adoption of income supplements uh, for families at a certain income level. Um, all of those, you know, different states, different municipalities adopted different kinds of measures. I'd really like to see research um, evaluating the impact that, that these different measures have on, on drug use, on, on overdose risk. Because it seems to me that um, those kinds of social policies are part of, you know, of the ways that we could address some of those fundamental uh, causes. But we don't have a lot, you know, we, we we don't have a lot of evidence yet. We know, for example, that right places with greater level of underemployment, greater level of deindustrialization, um, greater risk for work-related injuries because of unsafe regulations, all of those places experienced an increase um, in overdoses. Now the question is, what can we do about that? Um, I think with some of these new, new policies, we can evaluate and identify specific measures to, to address them. Yeah, I think that's right, Magda. And I, I liked your point too, where it would behoove us working in this space to say, by doing some of this, we would anticipate benefits in terms of overdose and uh, use disorders, but clearly there are many other public health and health benefits too. So maybe that's 
a, a great place to start in advocating for some of these fundamental causes and policy changes is to say like, we're, we're, we have crisis levels of overdose now, we need to address uh, that, but, but also there are many other ways um, to create a healthier society generally um, in the United States uh, that, that addressing some of these fundamental causes would address. So um, I, I think you know, that's something for all of us maybe to take away from Magda's excellent point is that yes, they would have benefits in terms of overdose, but many other health endpoints and health in general as well. Yeah. Right, the payoff could be huge, right? Yeah. Cross cutting. Yeah. Yeah, and linked to that, of course, is, you know, all the giant, I know Jennifer knows it's a big issue in West Virginia is addressing childhood trauma, right? So we yeah. know that if you, um, children that have more adverse experiences and traumatic events have a, have a constellation, they're at a, a higher risk of a constellation of health problems, not just uh, mental health and substance use, uh, so increased rates of drug use and uh, substance use disorders. So really trying to, you know, understand, I mean, I think we have enough data that, you know, primary provision, uh, provision of mental health to children and adolescents is primary prevention of drug use. Um, and a reinvestment in that, um, the prevention world, particularly uh, the, depending on the age, but really understanding that for uh, children would be, you know, really critical and have tremendous benefits, I think, um, in terms of return on investment and, and issues that we could uh, improve. I mean, it's a, it's a serious problem here. And, and then also really thinking about, you know, in the context of intergenerational um, drug use, um, and, you know, we had, um, what, uh, upwards of uh, 70,000 overdose deaths. I think that's for uh, 2019. So many of those people who um, have died were parents. So really understanding what that impact is on those children uh, that are left without a parent, the grandparents and other extended family members that are trying to care for these. And then in some cases, you know, the, the children that haven't, uh, that, that um, are, go into the foster care system. You know, in West Virginia, we have over 6,500 children in foster care. And we absolutely, our system is broken. They are, the federal government is suing the state around our, our, our ability to care for these children. So it's not just that we, we, we knew this before the overdose epidemic, but now it becomes even more um, really elevated and concerning uh, in, in that population. And, and we have a real opportunity to change things for the families that have been impacted by opiate use disorders and overdose deaths, uh, in addition to preventing, well, obviously primary prevention of these deaths is of critical importance, but really trying to understand how we can uh, wrap around support to those families um, will be equally important in terms of preventing their transition to drug use. Um, and having uh, opportunities to live healthier lives. I'm so glad Dr. Wynn Stanley brought up ACEs. Um, you know, I'm a psychologist and I work in family medicine. So of course I'm gonna <laughs> talk about that. Um, but we are, you know, everything that we've talked about today already is prevention for the next generation. If we keep people's parents out of jail for a prolonged periods of time, if we prevent ex extensively long separations from the family, if we treat their parents' mental illness, if we treat their parents' substance use disorder, then the children who are growing up are going to be at reduced risk for um, substance use later in life. I just got to say that might be like one of my new favorite phrases and way to talk about this, that everything that we're doing now is prevention for the next generation. That's really nice. Oh, I saw an unmute. So I was giving it a moment there. Um, so um, talking about fundamental causes. And as we sort of move forward, as a reminder, anybody who's in attendance, if you have a question, please feel free to put it into the chat. And panelists, if you've got a burning question for some other panelists, this is also a moment where if you're interested, you can put it up. Uh, while we're again thinking about this, there was a comment earlier on when we were talking about our very first question about um, prescription drug monitoring programs and sort of this shift that happened with chronic pain patients sort of getting pushed either into the OUD care system or just out of the system entirely. To what extent, and, and the part I want to focus on here is there's a, there's a piece here in that question that asks, how do we ensure that people who are affected by these policies are involved in their development? 
you know, so how do, do chronic pain patients have a place or a seat at the table to discuss how the policies are going to change prescribing? Do people who are using drugs have a spot at the table for large scale policy changes like measure 110? Uh, what are some of the mechanisms to think about this? What is it done well? What's not done well? Where are we going forward for this? Uh, just how do we ensure that the stuff that we develop, that we think about both for research and policy, that we're, we're listening to the people that are involved in this so we can avoid you know, some of these miscommunications that have come up or these situations where we're suddenly totally upending people's lives because of policy that made sense. But if we listened or talked to a little bit more, uh, we might have dodged some problems. I want to address it by actually sharing a personal experience, which is right before I moved to West Virginia, I went to actually one of the um, <clears throat> FDA's hearings on naloxone. So this was thinking about 2015 or 2016. And I have to actually tell you, it was the public comment section that really honestly radicalized me in, in overdose prevention because it's hearing those personal stories, you know, and that's where we kind of sometimes get a disconnect, right, between our policies and our research is when we aren't really listening to the people that are impacted. And actually anyone who's interested, you should go back and read the transcript. I used to actually share exact text from the transcript when a parent was saying directly to FDA and other policymakers about the experience of where, why didn't I know about naloxone the first time my son overdosed, the second time my son overdosed. This drug has been around as long as I've been alive. And so, you know, to hear the frustration of parents to say, this is available and no one told me, it was so shameful. I mean, it really was dramatically shameful. So I'm, I'm really encouraged though, to start to see that at least in research, which in drug research, which I think is important, and, and my colleagues on the panel might have uh, opinions too, really beginning to see an emphasis on having community advisory boards, having representation, because I think you know, that's part of what happens is getting folks more involved, the people directly impacted, patients, uh, family members involved in the research pro pro um, process, um, understanding, you know, elevating the importance of things like patient reported outcomes, right? We've always, you know, um, more highly elevated objective, you know, clinical reports, but really understanding the patient perspective. Um, how can we deliver patient-centered care without knowing what the patient wants? <laughs> I mean, these are some really basic questions. Um, and I, uh, the and I, the NIDA has a new um, grant uh, system that they're going to have on uh, pain and opioids. It's called the Empower Network. Um, and I've been actually quite pleased to see that um, there is an active voice from day one of people that are suffer with pain and have an opiate use disorder because those voices need to be heard throughout the process. So at least that's a step in, in, in the correct direction, I would think. And I know that there's significantly more that we can be doing. Yeah, I agree with all of those excellent points. I, I would add one thing, which is that, you know, from a researcher perspective, I think we have to understand um, why it can be so challenging for people who are actively using drugs or for people who have lived experience or in recovery to um, engage, engage. You know, we've, we've heavily uh, criminalized this issue for decades and decades. And so it's not, and there's so much stigma that it's, it's not necessarily something that people are, are willing to shout from the rooftops about. So there's a lot of trust that needs to be built there Right, and it's I think the researchers' responsibility to take the lead on that and and to build that relationship and to acknowledge that there has been a, a lot of harm done um, in the past, and so that's one thing. I think the second thing is that we need to pay people um, for their for their expertise. Uh, so we have to acknowledge that they bring expertise and then compensate them appropriately um, for their time and their insights. Uh, and so that that is a, a continual um, process, I think, is, is also just not a one time transaction. It's about building that relationship and then acknowledging that expertise and and uh, compensating that up appropriately. So those are just two insights that I've had sort of working here in terms of how to do that effectively. But honestly, I do think uh, myself and others, we can always do better as well, um, and to continue to learn from people 
um, who are experts in their own lives. Yeah, I think there's a, there's a great opportunity with all of these new policy changes to, to think about how we can involve uh, communities with lived experience, uh, people who use drugs within the research, right? So as we're thinking, so for example, today the uh, NYU Center for Drug Use uh, and HIV Research um, sponsored a seminar on uh, Oregon 110 and um, uh, Jules Netherland from Drug Policy Alliance and Alex Kral um, from RTI were talking about principles to evaluate Oregon 110. And the whole thing was about how do, do we, one of the key principles was how do we involve uh, people with lived experience in this whole evaluation process in terms of formulating the questions, thinking about what exactly we're measuring um, and doing the, the actual research. So I think, think having those as central elements when we think about how do we do these evaluations so that they're maximally informative and so that we can understand uh, what is it that we should be measuring? What should we care about? Uh, how are these uh, policies affecting people who are who's benefiting and who's not? It's re is really critical. Just give it a beat to see it unmutes or not and see how people are basically hands up as the unmute at the moment. Um, fantastic information about thinking about this, how we involve everybody along the way. Um, so I want to sort of draw on something a little bit that's come up in a lot of the discussions today. We've talked about, you know, um, racialist equity or dealing with past racial discrimination. And, and in the U.S., you know, it's a, a highly racialized society. And particularly when you look at the history of drug policy and drug laws in the United States, there's really not a single drug law back into the 1800s or before that wasn't in some way dealing with classifying a group of people based off some observable characteristic, sorting them into a system, creating a hierarchy around it, and saying substance use of a specific type is associated with this group and we're going to penalize this or we're going to treat them differently. You know, you can go back to the early alcohol laws, the shifts in the statewide laws before the federal prohibition in 1914 all the way up to the current era where you see differences in how cocaine was handled based off who was presumed to use it in the 1980s. And today we think about uh, charges of how the response to opioids, overdoses and crises in different parts of the country with different presumed groups of people who were using them is offered differently and with different levels of compassion. Often we see that contrast between, you know, the response in the 80s, which was maximum punishment across the board to now we're talking about harm reduction, primary prevention, we're talking about decriminalization. So we live in this racialized society. We've seen this in drug policy and history through you know, 150, 200 years in the United States. So how do we think about this with developing new policy? How do we develop stuff that addresses this, that doesn't just reinforce this hierarchy moving forward again and again? And you know, I'm just really curious to hear the panel's thoughts on this, either in your own work or uh, the research we do and moving forward. Um, you know, what is the way forward with this? Is recognition enough or do we have to do more? One thing, Patrick, I've liked uh, a lot today is the focus on this idea of looking at who benefits, right? So we, we are, have been talking about new, new resources, a new focus on say harm reduction or new treatment resources. One thing we can do as researchers is to map and evaluate who is benefiting from these new financial or, or other types of uh, resources, identify how those may be you know, exacerbating historical inequities and then try to carve a path forward for um, addressing them. So for example, one thing uh, we've done is to actually look at the OUD treatment landscape in the US and we and others have showed that even access to treatment is highly racialized in terms of um, what treatment resources are available in specific communities. So this is kind of getting back to my earlier point, right, is where through policy we could explicitly identify that and try to um, correct some of those existing uh, inequities that exist in terms of access to evidence-based um, treatment. And I think without explicit focus 
and thought around that. A lot of these new developments or new policies, be it decriminalization, full uh, legalization of substances or new resources, unfortunately, because of this history um, and the current structure of US society, uh, will we'll just exacerbate inequities. Um, so I think this needs to be first and foremost um, in a focus in terms of research and then also uh, enactment of new policies or interventions. It really raises the question too, whether can we address racial inequities without tackling, uh, without addressing criminalization of drug use? Yeah. Um, they are, you know, it, it's really, I don't, I'd like to, can I ask the panel a question? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what do you guys think? You're, you're working in this space in drug use. I, I don't know that we can, but I'd, I'd be interested in what you all think. Well, coming from the maternal health world, everything that we are doing now um, for moms who are in recovery from um, opioid use disorder, we, we knew to do in the 80s um, for cocaine use disorder. We were not doing it because of who was, as you said, presumed to be using the drug. Um, and so I, I, you, you almost cannot disentangle criminalization of, of substance use and um, African-American in particular and other minorities, but particularly we're talking about African-American folks. And I think that's why it's, it's especially important as we've been talking with other stakeholder groups that they, they be involved in these discussions and not just involved, but believed. You know, I, I have a lot of patients who um, their pain, their self-reported pain and pain threshold and experience is not believed at all. And I think a lot of it has to do uh, with the assumptions that other people make based on their appearance. Yeah, I think decriminalization, legalization is, is one step forward in addressing that. Uh, but, I, but I also think that without having a social determinants of health framework to, to decriminalization, say, or to any kind of policy, I don't think we're going to change those inequalities. Um, you know, I think, you know, from, from the data that I've seen, even with marijuana legalization, there's still persistent racial inequalities and arrests, uh, even after legalization, right? Um, and I think that's because there are these fundamental causes, right, of racial inequalities and in everything, in every aspect of life, and every kind of health condition, and um, and so I think we need to to think about these policies in conjunction with what are the fundamental causes of these inequalities. What are the the social, the structural, the economic causes of these inequalities? And and thinking about um, when implementing these policies and evaluating them, what are the other kinds of social economic policies that need to be enacted at the same time to, to address these underlying social conditions that create um, these inequalities. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit optimistic that that is happening. I know um, I'm part of a working group for the National Academy of Medicine where they're trying to push for the social determinants of health framework on how to um, address opiate use disorder. So, you know, and I, I've seen that um, at different levels and, and that's great, but and I hope that it's just the beginning of a shift in our thinking about drug policy. Checking the time, I think we have about five minutes left. Um, I haven't seen new questions in the chat. I've still got a couple queued up. Are there any other questions that the panelists have for each other, or is there something that you really hope to talk about that we didn't get to, or you want to really draw back down onto in these last few minutes that we have together? I have another burning question. <laughs> Sorry, I love this topic. Magda, I don't want to put you on the spot, but there is, uh, given your work, um, and you might be the best person, other folks might want to respond too, but I'm really interested, you know, it, I think it was about a a year and a half ago, there's a lot of discussion about um, the extent to which in, in areas that have legalized marijuana, um, that you know, people could be moved, transitioned from prescription opiates to marijuana. And, and I don't know how much of your work is at that intersection, but it's gonna be such a critical question, I think from a public consumption of science, right? Like to what extent is this gonna be a good thing? Um, I have my own opinions, but 
it, you know, if your work is focusing on both, I'd love to hear what you have to say, because I think there's kind of a disconnect between where the science is at and where the public is at. <laughs> That's not even policy, right? Like public opinion is somewhere. Policy is over here and science is, I don't know. I think science is like maybe down the street. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That I think, it, yeah, it's, it's such a, we're grappling with that question right now. So, so we have a study to look at how, you know, the joint enactment of policies that regulate the prescription opiate supply and liberalize access to cannabis, how those two interact and affect uh, use of opioids and, and overdose and, and prescribing. Um, and it's, it's, it's a difficult question. And so our hypothesis was indeed, right? Like if you, so if you cut off or if you reduce the prescription opioid access, but you increase access to cannabis, is that going to lead people to transition to using cannabis or to initiating cannabis rather than initiating opioids? And is that going to reduce shift to, to heroin and to, and to synthetics? Um, I, I, I don't think yet there's, there's a clear answer. So there, there, there were a few papers that showed a decline in overdose in states that legalized uh, recreational use of cannabis. But then there was a more recent uh, paper by uh, Chelsea Shover that suggests that, uh, that that might not be the case or that the effect might vary over time. Um, we, we are trying to, to understand that now and looking at you know um, what's the specific impact of uh, laws that increase access to medical use of cannabis versus recreational use of cannabis. Um, some of our findings suggest that perhaps um, states that provide the most liberalized access to cannabis, those states may experience a greater decline in overdose, but the findings are still very preliminary and we're still trying to, to, to understand them. So I don't think we, I'm sorry, we, I don't think we have a very clear answer yet. Um, and the, the challenge also with these laws is that A, they're very recent and B, they're enacted with so many other laws, right? And so it's really hard to figure out what is the, the, the cannabis legalization effect and what's, you know, the naloxone access law effect, um, the whatever, the, the, or, or the shift in the fentanyl market. So we're trying to grapple with all of these confounding factors at the same time. We hope to have an answer soon. Uh, but not yet. Thanks, I appreciate it. It's a Brent. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, yeah, it's a it's a challenging um, challenging piece. We we just did publish one study that Magda was involved in here in Rhode Island, where we linked PDMP data and uh, medical cannabis licensure records, and did not find changes in opioid prescribing after someone received a medical cannabis license. Um, but there was a lot of limitations to that studies we, study. We didn't have a lot of other data or information on diagnoses necessarily, um, reasons why people were using prescription opioids and so forth. Uh, so it, there were some limitations there, but um, a lot of interesting work, I think that could be, that could and should be done. Um, around this as the policy landscape changes. Absolutely. Uh, so I just want to draw a quick attention to, we got a brief side question for the panel. I'm not sure if I know the answer to this either. Uh, what are the technical terms for what is colloquially referred to as marijuana maintenance? Someone's trying to get a little bit more information and it's curious if we have better search terms for them. I'm not sure that I do, any of you? No, nope, sorry. I am not familiar with that term. No, I, I am. My apologies. That's a new one for me. I think we'll all be doing a little bit of research on our own <laughs> on that one. All right. So I think we're about time. Um, I'd really like to thank all the panelists today. This has been fantastic. I really appreciate your engagement today, as well as in the lead up to this. This has been you've all been a dream to work with as far as being engaged and sending stuff back and forth. And I really appreciate it. And for all of our attendees, I hope you had a really great time listening to this expert level discussion about a whole range of things. And I hope it has been an informative process for you all. Um, I think at one point we were close to 40 attendees. So that's, that's a pretty solid attendance record for everybody. Um, 
Just like to remind you all, this is day one of this conference. There's two more days coming up. So check your conference schedule. I think Callie's just put it up on the screen share. Uh, so day two, we're starting at 8 a.m. Central. I'm not sure who scheduled that, but it's bright and early. So come on down through the opening remarks, our keynote for Colleen Hanlon, break, a poster session, and a talk on community-engaged research. So we are super looking forward to having you throughout the rest of this conference, uh, our three-day symposium. Delight to have you all here today. And on behalf of us all, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you to all the panelists for your great discussion and time today. Thank you so much. This was really, really interesting and fun and really appreciated uh, getting to know uh, th those of you who I didn't know and just the opportunity to talk about these important topics. Uh -huh.